Charming Eva Garza is a star on the CBS network of the Americas. She has just returned from another tour through Latin America. And when you hear her sing the tango, Quiero verte una vez más, you'll understand why our listeners in Latin America think she's tough. Senorita Garza and Quiero verte una vez más, just to see you once more. Tarde que me invita a conversar con los recuerdos, pena de esperar si te llorar en este entierro. Tanto en mi amargura te busqué sin encontrarte. Cuando, cuando vida moriré. Para olvidarte Quiero verte una vez más Amar conmigo Y extasiarme en el mirar De tus pupilas Quiero verte una vez más Aunque me di que ya todo terminó y es inútil remover las cenizas de un amor quiero verte una vez más estoy tan triste y no puedo recordar porque te fuiste quiero verte una vez más y en mi agonía un alivio sentiré y olvidada en un rincón más tranquila moriré noche que consigues envolver mis pensamientos quejas que buscando nuestro ayer las lleva el viento sangre que ha vertido el corazón al evocarte, fiebre que me abraza la razón, sin olvidarte. Una vez más estoy tan triste y no puedo recordar por qué te fuiste. Quiero verte una vez más y en mi agonía un alivio sentiré y olvidada en un rincón más tranquila amor. You were just listening to Eva Garza, a Lanier High School graduate from the 1930s when Mexican-American high school girls rarely graduated, much less became major musical stars at the local, national, and international level. Why didn't I know about Eva when I attended Lanier 40 years later? But that's why we now have this amazing museo and we want you to look and listen for her music and ask yourself, why isn't she in our Texas or US history books? Buenas noches, queridos, queridas. My name is Graciela Sanchez and thanks for being with us today to learn and engage with our panelists as we learn more about the history of San Antonio's historic West Side. Tonight's Platica, Poder de Mujer, honors the amazing stories, histories of the brilliant, creative, passionate, and fearless women of San Antonio's West Side. It is also Esperanza's desire to share with you our virtual Museo del West Side and the exhibit 
women and activism in the West Side, curated by these two amazing mujeres, Dana Guerra and Laura Hernandez Erisman. I was born and raised in San Antonio's working class West Side, as was my great grandmother, Teresa Cantu Rocha, my grandmother, Francisca Casillas, and of course, my mother, Isabel Sanchez. I was raised to love and respect my Mexican roots, to treat all people with respect and dignity, to care for our neighbors, especially the little children y los viejitos and viejitas, to stand in solidarity with the poor and working class, and to speak out against the injustices in our city and in this world. I am grateful to be part of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, where we work to implement the enduring values of our parents, abuelas, y toda la buena gente of the past, and to challenge the dominant culture of racism, misogyny, homo and transphobia, and economic exploitation. Thousands of you have been part of the Esperanza over 33 years, and we look forward to many more years together. Esperanza will continue to speak truth to power, challenge racism, homo and transphobia, imperialism, and climate change. We invite you to spend the next hour and a half with us, and then to let others in the community tune in via our Esperanza Facebook and YouTube sites if they miss tonight's platica. I'd also like to remind you to, to help us build this exhibit by adding the stories of other West Side women activists, your story or your abuelas, your tias, your activist friend that lives across the street, the ones who are working hard to improve the lives of la gente del West Side, but who are not recognized. And if they are, they're usually demonized because the, they don't behave like the docile Mexican women that we have been stereotyped to be like. And if you like our work, please consider becoming a monthly donor of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. We survive and thrive because of the support and love we get from the community. And check in with us and maybe you'll, uh, uh, if you become a monthly donor and get a beautiful mask of uh, made by Mary Agnes Rodriguez. With this, I'd like to introduce our guest curators. Dana Guerra is a certified archivist with over 20 years experience as a professional and consulting archivist, working with university, government, and private archival repositories. She is also an experienced cultural heritage researcher, a member of the Westside Preservation Alliance, and serves on the advisory board of the Museo del West Side. Laura Hernandez Erisman is a cultural historian who lives in Austin with a PhD in American studies from the University of Texas at Austin. She was an associate professor at St. Edwards University for 12 years and has written extensively on San Antonio's history. Her book, Inventing the Fiesta City, Heritage and Carnaval in San Antonio, was published by the University of New Mexico Press in 2008 and released as a paperback in 2016. She is currently working on a manuscript on the social history of Latinx workers at Kelly Air Force Base. Thanks for joining us today and please, Donna Guerra, I pass it on to you. Thank you very much, Graciela. Good evening, everybody. Um, Graciela has just introduced me. So um, I just wanna say that we're beginning this evening with a little, a brief video tour. One video that is led by me, one tour, and then the next led by Laura. So let's go ahead and begin with um, the first video uh, part of the tour, please. Hello, my name is Donna Guerra and I'm a co-curator of the present exhibit, Women and Activism in the West Side. Welcome to this brief tour of the Museo del West Side, a community museum at the corner of history and social justice, a project of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. The Museo del West Side is dedicated to preserving and presenting the unique history, heritage, culture, pride, work ethic, and diverse experiences of La Gente del West Side. We hope to increase understanding and appreciation of the neighborhood and its people. 
The brick and mortar museo is currently in development at the historic Rubens Ice House, located at the Rinconcito de Esperanza at 816 South Colorado Street in the heart of San Antonio's historic West Side. As a community participatory museum, we collaborate with the community to develop the museum's exhibits and programming. In this extraordinary year of 2020, the work that we envisioned for Rubens Ice House and the additional physical construction has been greatly slowed down, but fundraising and architectural planning continues behind the scenes. We decided it was important to keep moving in a virtual way, and so we share the inaugural Museo del Westside website and exhibit. The virtual Women and Activism in the West Side exhibit pays tribute to our amigas, hermanas, madres y abuelas who have acted out of love for their barrios, who have expressed commitment to preserving human dignity through canciones, protests, petitions, church and school groups, writings, and within the halls of political offices. The exhibit tells a more inclusive story of women activists in the West Side, women who marched, boycotted and rallied and sang for social change, women who organized church tamaladas like Sebastiana Ramirez Rodriguez. Sebastiana Ramirez Rodriguez is the grandmother of Maria Beriosabal, who wrote her profile and supplied the photo albums and photos for her exhibit. Some women circulated petitions and spoke out at city council meetings about flooding and problems in the neighborhoods like Cecilia Moreno, the mother of Esperanza member Beatrice Moreno. Some women intentionally worked toward the change they wished to see, such as caring for health and political equity, like Maria Rebecca Latigo de Hernandez, who is the grandmother of Mary Jo Galindo. And many examples of women who acted on what they believe, like Olivia Sanchez Zamaripa, who is the grandmother to Ramon Vasquez. Usually members of the community or their children or grandchildren or close friends wrote the profiles and shared their old photo albums, which we have made digital. We have worked together to preserve personal recollections from La Memoria in memory of antepasados. The relationship of consultation and exchange ensures that community members have authority about how their stories are told. Some nationally known women are side by side with much less famous women, but they are together in one exhibit intentionally because we view their actions as of equal importance. Museo deliberately privileges grassroots voices as authorities about their lived experience, sitting on the front porch kinds of stories from the streets that are familiar to us. Colorado, San Jacinto, San Fernando, Montezuma, and Veracruz streets. This virtual exhibit will grow over the next few months as we collect more stories to share. And we welcome you to contact us with your contributions. Who else's story should be featured here? Could it be your abuela, your mom, your tia, your sister, or even you? Find out more about how to contribute a story to this exhibit.
Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Hernandez Ersmans. I am the other co curator of the exhibit. So what we are going to do now is, is show you another short video that kind of um, highlights some um, profiles and some of the features of the exhibit to help you kind of navigate and know what um, what content we have. And so now I will um, we'll turn to that second video and then we'll begin our um, discussion with our panelists. Hello. My name is Laura Hernandez Ersman, and I am the other co-curator of this exhibit. I wanted to follow up on Donna's presentation by highlighting a few distinct aspects of this exhibit and how they exemplify this as a community participatory museum. I want to start off with uh, Emma Tenayuka, uh, one of the earliest profiles that we completed. She is a person who has now um, been, you know, widely um, recognized for her leadership in the pecan sheller strike of 1938. And so she's gotten a lot of well-deserved attention um, recently, and she's represented in many other um, uh, public history spaces. So we wanted to make her profile here a, a little distinct by adding details that really situate her life in the context of the West Side. So a couple of examples is, one, we talked about her as a high school student at Brackenridge High School, how she excelled at basketball and debate. And another example is you can see this clip over here on the bottom left hand corner of her speaking at an International Women's Day rally in March. Um, and this is in the, um, the later years of her life after she returned to San Antonio. And it's details like this that really kind of highlight that her activism, of course, continued um to the end of her life and that she was uh, well established in in the west side and part of this community for many years the second example i want to share is uh cecilia sanchez moreno so her story has not been um, shared in many other public spaces but she was a prominent um, member of the west side community she was president of a PTA. She was a prominent member of the St. Agnes Parish. And um, her daughter told us stories about how she supported her neighbors when they were displaced by flooding. You know, how she um, gave them temporary housing and, and fed them um, while, you know, the, their houses were inaccessible. I also wanted to show you that this narrative was written by her daughter, Beatriz. And we wanted to keep her daughter's narrative as it was. It's this beautiful historia that is, you know, written from her daughter's perspective. And we like these examples because they make the exhibit, um, you know, really include community voices. And we, we want this to be this kind of um, community-centered, multivocal exhibit. So we thought this was a good example of that. So the other thing I want to talk about are the themes. Um, we wrote these broader kind of contextual pieces just to um, uh, explain some of the kinds of activism, explain some background on some of the organizations and institutions that are connected to these stories. And we found that, that, that each of these women rarely could be contained to just one theme. So we included several. So you'll see in each profile, these buttons that kind of link them to particular themes. And if you click on them, so I'll click on the Becoming the Beloved Community as an example, it'll take you to that theme, which just gives that broader context about faith-based service and social justice in the West Side and contextualizes the profiles um, that are about that. If you want to see all of the themes, you can click here at the top exhibit themes and you'll see all eight of them that we have. Um, the most recent uh, is about uh, parteras and traditional healers, um, you know, midwives who were vital to the community. Um, and we just included that this week. It's an essay that was written by Antonio Castaneda for La Voz several years ago, and we thought it was excellent context for here. And the last thing I wanted to mention was that um, all of these themes, you know, we realized are, um, you know, this museum is about place and about stories in place. So we thought, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could map out some of these themes and tell that story through maps. So we started to do that. 
And if you click on story map, you'll see the, the one that we've completed now, which is Arte y Corazón, about Westside Cultural Institutions. And as you click on these arrows, it'll take you through that same theme, but you know through locations on the map. So this one starts at uh, Las Carpas, uh, which this is kind of a was a, a staging area for those traveling uh, tent shows. Um, tells a little bit more here about La Carpa Garcia. Um, then we move on to the teatros, to Saragossa Nacional, goes on to Teatro Progreso and others. We also later in this tour um, talk about um, uh, revistas like Caracol and how that was so important for the Chicano Movimiento and, um, and Spanish radio and television. Um, so you just take this through and you can see those that kind of chronological history mapped out um, here. We also included uh, you women who are profiled in the exhibit whose stories are connected. We included um, uh, segments about them as well. So for example, La Chata Noruesca, you know, performed at Nacional uh, many, many times. And so, you know, and this is approximately where she was, where she was born. And so we, uh, when we had those kind of um, uh, places on the map to mark, we, we wanted to include those profiles here as well. So that is just a small sampling of, of some of the things that we offer in these exhibits. Uh, in this exhibit, we encourage you to explore more and we encourage you to share your own stories, share your feedback with us. Um, as we continue to um, grow this exhibit and, and, and it evolves in the next several months. Thank you so much. All right. So what we are going to do now is we're going to introduce our uh, distinguished panelists and um, Donna and I are gonna, gonna sort of take turns introducing each of, each of them. Um, but I'm going to start with Maria Antonieta Pariosaba. Um, she was born in Laredo, Texas. Her parents brought her to San Antonio as a baby. She began her community work as a teenager in her parish in the West Side. As a young woman, she began organizing Mexican Americans, Chicanas, and their families around neighborhood issues and political participation. In 1981, she was elected to the San Antonio City Council, becoming the first Latina to be elected to such a position in San Antonio. She left office in 1991 and continued her work at the national and international level, serving in the Inter-American Commission on Women of the OAS of the United Nations and other boards. Maria is a staunch and consistent supporter of individuals and grassroots organizations, promoting principles of human rights, sustainable development, economic justice, and values of cultural diversity and gender equity. And so I would like to introduce our another panelist, Ramon Vasquez. He was born in San Antonio and is an enrolled member of the Top Pilam Kwawotekan Nation. He has specialized in the development and implementation of intervention projects amongst Latino street gangs in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and San Antonio, Texas. Ramon was instrumental in the establishment of a five-year peace truce between six of San Antonio's most notorious street gangs from 1994 to 1999. In 1999, he was appointed and currently serves as executive director of the American Indians in Texas at the Spanish Colonial Missions. I think it's AITSCM. Um, uh, Ramon has spent the last 20 years specifically working on community mobilization and community academic partnerships, primarily focusing on American Indian advocacy and the mobilization of men and boys of color. Ramon has served as the mayor's appointed chairman for the Violence Prevention and Recidivism Reduction Committee for My Brother's Keeper Initiative, Mayor's Task Force on Police and Community Relations Council, and currently serves as the mayor's appointee on the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. Ramon is the co-founder of the National Urban Indian Family Coalition, headquartered in Seattle, Washington, which represents 
30 US cities, including San Antonio. Okay, so next we have um, Dr. Carmen Tafoya, who is the author of more than 30 books. She is Professor Emeritus of Bi Cultural Bilingual Studies at UTSA and a native of Westside San Antonio. She was San Antonio's first city poet laureate and then followed that to become one of the state poet laureates of Texas. She is the recipient of numerous national and international awards and has been recognized by the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies for work, quote, which gives voice to the peoples and the cultures of this land. And last, the last of our four panelists, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mary Jo Galindo, she is an archaeologist and owner of Galindo Envi Environmental Consulting in Austin and San Antonio, Texas. She has more than 20 years of experience conducting archaeological projects throughout the state, including a recent testing project at the Alamo. Dr. Galindo's dissertation documented some of the first ranching communities in Texas that were associated with the 18th century colony of Nuevo Santander. And those are our panelists this evening. So I, I'd like to begin by asking um, the first question we have for all of you. Um, it's the same question uh, and we will ask each of you to, to answer it in your way. And um, I have to find it. <laughs> okay, here it is. So uh, the question is, um, and we'd like to recommend that approximately five minutes each person in answering if, um, if that works for you. So the question is, first, we'd like to ask each of you to reflect on your experience as part, being part of this exhibit. Um, what drew you to participate in this exhibit? And uh, anything, tell us about any things you learned in the process of telling your own stories uh, and uh, telling the stories of the mujeres and your familias. So um, if we could start, um, Ramon, with you. If you could unmute. There you go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you again. Uh, so so um, yeah, so you, you know, Graciela's invitation was very, um, Appreciated, appreciated. I, uh, I really, you know, thought about it and said, yeah, you know what? You know, my grandmother has only been uh, gone for a couple of years, so you know, it was still kind of very fresh, and so, uh, so it was, it was good. I mean, and you know, the opportunity that I had to just reflect on, you know, obviously how much, you know, she meant to me and my family. Um, and just you know, so just recognizing. I, I actually, I you know, I know she loved us, right? But you know, I think about when I when I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, um, I'm really blessed, you know, to come from such a to descend from such a long line of strong women who have served as anchors for our families, you know, since the early 1800s uh, here in San Antonio. And um, it, it really, I felt honored to be able to, to do this, you know, uh, for my family, uh, for my grandmother's great, great grandchildren, um, and specifically for my daughter. Uh, you know, um, that was uh, the opportunity to be able to do that was, was very important. So, I, you know, I, I reflected a lot on the stories, you know, growing up, because I grew up, I was raised by my grandmother and, and her mother. Um, and growing up, listening to the stories of my great grandmother's mother and what she had to do and what she did for her children and for her community in Von Army, in Paso de las Garzas, and San, coming to San Antonio. And my great grandmother having to learn Mexican because nobody spoke. Uh, because all her friends spoke Mexican, she did it. And uh, my grand and my grandmother, having uh, only gone to the eighth grade at Lanier, um, you know, and and still 
doing what she did for our family. She was definitely our matriarch and uh, she was definitely our source of strength. She was definitely our rock for all of her children. And um, it, was, it, it was a beautiful opportunity to reflect. You know, uh, obviously I was a tough chavalon too, you know, and when I lived with her, I made her life miserable. So I, I probably contributed to the canas on her head. You know, I'm sure I did. But, you know, I thought about, you know, I know how much she loved me. And, you know, I thought about her nicknames for me. You know, her, um, I was, I was, uh, when I came into the house, I was manos de fierro, pata de rastrillo, because I was always breaking something or dragging something in. And, uh, you know, just kind of being able to um, take that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that love that she gave me in that way and match it up with all the things that she did, you know, um, not for our family, but for our community and for other mujeres. Um, you know, if she stood on the shoulders of giants, I am definitely on the show, standing on shoulders of, I don't know what you'd call them now, is, uh, she set the bar really high for us. And so I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to reflect on um, and, and her life work, uh, raising her children, all the tragedies that she had in her life and uh, still be able to maintain her activism and her, uh, her democratic principles and, and um, her fight for women's rights, human rights, voting rights, um, and so I, it's a principle that I definitely want to continue to share with my children. I think they already know that. They're out there doing their thing now. Um, act, uh, they're activists in their own rights now. And, um, and I'm just, thank you to the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center for um, preserving this uh, history and being able to share it with the rest of San Antonio and, uh, and now through technology, the rest of the country. But that's my five minutes, I think. That's great. And thank you um, for being so giving of, of the history, because uh, we can't do it without you, obviously. Thank you. So um, maybe, uh, uh, Maria, would you like to go next? Can you unmute Maria? I thought I was on top of it. Yes, and I, yes it's okay. Anyway, um, Ramon gave me a great segue uh, to start by thanking the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, uh, not only for the invitation, Graciela, and all the buena gente, but uh, thanking you and being so happy that I had the opportunity to be with you back in 1987 when the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center opened in San Antonio and uh, the great work that you have done. I thank uh, Laura and uh, Donna and the staff uh, for this invitation also. And how could I say no uh, to this? Uh, I uh, think it is so important for us to tell our story. That's why I wrote my book, Maria, Daughter of Immigrants back uh, in 2012, uh, because uh, we all have wonderful stories. And see, wonderful stories doesn't mean that they're perfect stories. It doesn't mean that they're perfect families. It doesn't mean that we're perfect people and that we have conquered the world, whatever. It's our story and we are part of a community. So when we share our story, we are sharing the story of a comunidad, of a people. And I think in the United States of America today, there is a huge need for us as Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Hispanics, Latinos uh, to be known. I watch cable news and, and I see how we're not understood. We're not even there. And we have to write our stories. Uh, and uh, the what I just had to do when I started reflecting and uh, thinking about this exhibit is to write the story of my grandmother, Sebastiana Ramirez Rodriguez. Uh, and I sat down and I wrote it quickly. 
because it's a story that I grew up with. I know it, it's there. And with most of us, the stories are there. And, uh, you know, her life of 92 years chronicles all these events in the United States as seen by uh, people, the humble people of our country, the ones who have um, made Texas for sure uh, what it is, who have made San Antonio what it is. And thank you to the Esperanza for the Museo. Uh, thank you for the, the narratives, for the opportunity for people to tell their story uh, regularly, for the exhibits of our pictures. And uh, I ask that everybody can do something. We either write our story, we either write the story of our mother, grandmother, sister, madrina, neighbor, whoever, uh, or we contribute. We send our little check uh, to, to the Esperanza to make it happen. Uh, why can't we have a Museo del West Side like the beautiful picture that we saw? Uh, I want to honor the other women uh, and the gentlemen on the panel. And what a privilege to have my little picture of when I ran for city council back in 1981 uh, together with these women. What it does, it makes me happy that while I'm still alive, somebody cares about the story because it's the story of Sixta Rodriguez, of Berenice Alvarado, of Magdalena Tijerina, of La Señora Yuela, La Señora Gomez, and I can go on and on with all the women who formed me in addition to my beloved tias. So thank you again to all of you and to those of you who are watching, write your story or write the story of somebody else. Gracias. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, uh, Carmen, uh, would you like to follow? Sure. I'd be honored to follow Maria, who's taught so many of us uh, by her example, by her daily uh, actions, by her beliefs. And she's one of many strong, strong women. Uh, I'm honored to be in the same exhibit with her and with all of you. Um, but I was asked a question by the young woman that wrote the biography on me. And she said, um, what is your, what are you proudest of about your accomplishments? And I thought, well, you know, people ask that a lot, but you know, when you've lived a long life, you do more like the great uh, Arcadia Lopez said, uh, pues no es porque soy tan, tan importante, es porque soy tan vieja. <laughs> you get a chance to do a lot of things the more years you live. And so I was thinking about that and it made me think about how it wasn't the things you might claim as being important in your life. The stuff that I was proudest of was saving the stories because I had always had uh, a tendency to spend time with any grandma or Thea or Thea or anybody that had stories of the past. And I had not only written those stories down and in some instances recorded them, but I actually got to work as my real job. Um, my first job out of college, I had three months in which to make some money to pay my textbooks with for, for the next year that I was going back to get a master's in I couldn't find a job anywhere. I had no, no experience as a waitress. I didn't type. I mean, all the things they needed, um, I didn't have. I didn't have experience at. And um, Father Rodriguez at Our Lady of Guadalupe had a little grant from Creative Arts of San Antonio. And um, he was looking for somebody who would record the folklore of the barrio. I said, my barrio? I could do that. Yeah, I can do that. And so for three months, I had the best job in the whole world. It was a little tiny part-time job, but I probably spent, I don't know, every hour I could, I could put into it. It was like the first uh, part-time job that took like 80 hours a week. And I got all the stories of all my tias. I got all the stories of the neighbors. I would, he gave me a list of people in his congregation to go talk to, pues esta viejita sabe mucho, and so I would go to her, and then she would say, pues yo no sé nada, pero, and then she'd tell me this ton of stuff, and then she'd refer to me, pero la que de veras sabe es mi comadre que vive por acá y por allá, said, and I would go, and I'd meet these wonderful people, 
that got me hooked. And so since then, I mean, you know, every time I had an elderly relative and everybody else is busy partying over there and here's the elderly day, I'm over in the, in the corner with her trying to talk to her and um, take, make copies of the pictures, um, make copies of the stories. And so it got me to thinking how important that was in my life, how good I felt about being connected, about having learned, because we all come from generations and generations of, of strength and resilience and people whose names we don't even know, but they survived so that we could survive. And it takes a while to find out who they are. Sometimes you just feel it at, a, at some level deep inside you, you feel some urge. Um, so being able to think about that and to be a part of this exhibit where that you know those important things are talked about not the superficial things like where you graduated from and what you did you know for for a living but um i could feel the power of these women's lives holding me up and i learned how small our part is how important but how small and how equal um we're all little fish we're all little fish and the little fish all together move the current and, and make the ocean happen. So we're, um, we're important, but we're not separated from our community. We're connected to everybody. What we do influences them. What they do influences us. Um, I, I learned that, I learned about my own history. Um, and I think sometimes we, we have a genetic memory. We have something that's left in us from experiences that maybe just get transmitted with a glance from somebody who's telling it to you and they, they get quiet at a certain point in the story and your intuition is picking up on something. We, we live with those pieces of the past and those pieces of the past give us strength in the present. Um, so I, I just feel very grateful to be part of this community and uh, very grateful that I've been able to um, preserve some of the stories of the community through whichever way I do it, whether it's through writing a story or whether it's through acting it out on stage or uh, teaching it in classes, every way we can to preserve our history and to preserve the very vital story, especially of those that have been forgotten, especially of those that have been erased. Um, La gente de color, las mujeres, uh, los indígenas, who have been ignored and erased more than anybody else in this country um, because of the threat that they represent to a myth of somebody, you know, self-made man making this nation all by themselves starting, you know, whenever you want to start at 1776 or 1836 or whatever you want to say. But... Um, these are the stories that need to be told if we are going to face life um, and community and public service and all of those areas with todo el corazón and with all of our honesty and our integrity. We have to speak for those who have not been able to share their voices or have their voices be heard. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was beautiful. And just as a note, um, you know, we did locate your um, writing of everything from Father Edmundo Rodriguez, um, the oral histories that you did. So I'm so thrilled that we located that work of yours from the 70s, right? So that's really terrific. Um, and then Mary Jo, you're the last but not least. And um, so again, the question about, you know, how was the experience of, of participating in this as exhibit for you? Thank you, Donna. And uh, thank you, Peace and Justice, uh, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center for sponsoring the museum. Um, in my mind, you guys have impeccable timing because I had just finished a book about uh, my grandmother and I'm working on getting that manuscript uh, published. But in the meantime, you know, I had, all of the photographs scanned and right at my fingertips. So 
when I heard about your project, it was um, a pleasure to take some of what I had already done and, and sort of repackage it uh, for your museum. And um, like I said, I was working on a book. It, it took me about a decade to finish. Um, I didn't have access to a lot of her papers. So I used La Prensa articles and, and oral history. I, uh, like Carmen, I had interviewed all of my aunts and my mother and my uncle and um, through the years. And so I had uh, that to fall back on the notes and the recordings from that. And um, I, was, I was challenged to, um, to write something about her. And um, I, you know, luckily kind of stumbled into the La Prensa articles and I was able to, you know, search a database that, um, well, for example, some of the lessons that I learned is that uh, social activism, you know, if you really mean it, it's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong commitment. And, um, you know, my grandparents started in 1929 and uh, they really never stopped. Even in the 1970s, they were active in the, the Raza Unida party. So, um, and I think oh, also what I learned is that even even humble people, uh, people with not a lot of money or education, they can come together and get uni united behind a cause. And um, you know, and, and there really is no limit to what you can accomplish. Um, back in the the height of the depression, um, Maria Hernandez was raising money for indigent women, and she did it by uh, collecting pennies. And you know, it may may not sound like much, but in today's dollars, it was several thousand dollars, and I'm sure it helped a lot of women and their children to survive. Um, so yeah, it, that was the biggest lesson I think was the the power of the people, and you know, a, a inspired leader can do. Thank you very much. Mary Jo. Um, so um, I think now we're, we're into the um, se segment where we ask each of you a specific question um, tailored to you. So Maria, I have a question for you and um, it is this. Your work as a city council member and as a social justice advocate is relatively well known by many of us in San Antonio. But what we have also learned from both your, your profile and your writing and your abuela's profile is the importance, the important influence of Catholic social teaching in your life. Could you tell us more about how faith um, has moved your life, shaped your life and work in the West Side? You need to unmute, please. Learn. Okay. Uh, you have a section in the um, the website on the beloved community, and I saw the picture, and it is a picture of memories. There's Father Ed Salazar from Guadalupe, who followed Father Edmundo Rodriguez. Uh, there is Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, this Cuban theolo theology theologian who had an immense influence in my life when she developed the Mujerista theology. There is my dear friend that died only a couple of years ago, Sister Maria Eva Flores that we called MC. There's Leonard Anguiano in the back who was one of the founders of the Mexican American, now Catholic college, but that was called the Cultural Center. And um, I think it's a national picture, but those are some people I recognize. And uh, I read that section and it's a beautiful section and reflects the, um, uh, the impact and value of faith on our people, our gente. And uh, that is the theme of my, uh, my abuelas, uh, my grandmother's story. And so is my other grandmother that was uh, in Lockhart, Texas. She never came to San Antonio, but both of them, uh, they, they survived and raised families in difficult times because of their faith 
So I grew up with that. I grew up with the, the Catholic uh, teachings from church and I went to Catholic school and my parents. And, uh, but then something very significant happened when I was in my twenties. And that's from 1962 to 1965, we had the Vatican II. Uh, and right at that time, uh, Father Edmundo Rodriguez came to Christ the King at my parish on the West side. And he wanted to know how many of us wanted to take some classes uh, from him on what had happened in um, uh, the Vatican II, the Vatican II documents. So I and some of the young people, some family members, we enrolled. And I don't know how long it was, but it was a full course uh, on the documents of Vatican II. And that enhanced my life, changed my life. You know, in your 20s, you're looking, you're looking, you're forming your, uh, your opinions, your political um, uh, environment that you're going to be in. Uh, and the big lesson of Vatican II was the theology of liberation, which is uh, the using faith uh, to help people, faith and religion, but I don't want to just go to religion because that's limited in a way, unless you go out and you practice it in the community. And what I learned, there was a sentence in, in the documents that when I read it, I remember uh, it's something that catapulted me from the pew out into the world. And it was that people, the Catholics in this situation had to be out in the world and it's cited as teachers, as doctors, as political leaders, as, you know, and it named all that. And that sentence was so powerful in my life because up to then I had been working, you know, to help people first with my family, then in my church. And it's like that document and what Father um, Edmundo taught us was that we had to take that faith out in the street and that we had to make a preferential option for the poor. It was about going a next step and saying, what I'm going to do is uh, work to help people that are oppressed, uh, people whose dignity uh, is hurt because they don't have just basic um, things they need, like housing, like food, like a good education, like health. And that became um, a, um, like a, a major force for my life. Uh, I call, I call my, my work, my ministry, but it's not something we talk about. Uh, uh, I was part of uh, Las Hermanas that you talk about. I was one of the members from San Antonio of the women who were nuns from across the country, Latinas, who formed this organization and then opened it up to lay women. And that's when I joined. So uh, there are these mentors uh, of mine, my pastor, Father Lawrence uh, Matula, who wrote me a letter and told me I had to be out in the community because I had leadership skills. And when I read that letter, I said, oh my goodness, this is a priest and, you know, and he's telling me that I have leadership skills and that I had an obligation to do something with him. Uh, so I meshed what I was doing at church and all those beliefs with my public life. And it it's to this day a joy uh, to um, think of the value and how much that is needed today. And that we, we shy away from talking about these things because we're afraid people will say, well, she thinks she's holier than thou, or sometimes we get, you know, things are said about us that we don't like, so we shy away. And then there are people that are using faith and religion for the wrong reasons to oppress. Uh, so I think we need to be braver about, uh, about that. And uh, so I thank uh, all the, the people, particularly the, particularly the priest, like Father Edmundo Rodriguez, who introduced me to my husband, Father Matula, Father um, Bernal, uh, Carmen Tafoya's little brother, 
uh, and uh, Father Benavides, who was very active in COPS and other leaders in our, in our religion. So thank you for asking me that question. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Maria. I, I just love the way that you talk about um, faith because <clears throat> it's, uh, and you're right that it's been sort of, um, some people have, have used faith to manipulate and to oppress, um, but, I, but I love to kind of keep in mind the other, um, the social justice um, teachings in a lot of our faith traditions. So thank you for that. Um, so my next question here is for you, Ramon. Uh, so we learned so much from you and from what you were, your father had, had uh, talked about and written about earlier um, about your abuela, Olivia Sanchez Samaripa, um, including as she was a very young um, a participant in the pecan shellers strikes. And, um, and then later she served as precinct chair for the, Demo for the Democratic Party. Um, as well as many, many other kind of grassroots um, protests and organizing and rallies that she was a part of. Uh, one part of her social justice work that we found particularly interesting was about the organization that she uh, helped to create, uh, the Native American Voters League. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that organization and, um, and maybe how you think it may have influenced later efforts, like the effort that you are a part of now to recognize Indigenous people's rights um, in the city. Yeah, thank, thank you for asking the question. Um, yeah, so, you know, Native American Voters League, 1939. Um, my grandmother was uh, 19 years old. Um, so she was, she had just come off the um, pecan strikes. Uh, and I, I always knew about those stories because, you know, my great grandmother would tell me about what the, you know, I knew they were uh, pecan shellers. So I always knew those, but it wasn't until I crossed this picture that I had never seen before. And I struggled to, to read it. And, and then I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe what it was saying, Native American Voters League in 1939 in San Antonio. And, um, and so I asked her about it. I'm talking about four years ago, five years ago, I asked her about it. And she, oh yeah, I know, yeah. And she started talking about it. And then I researched it, you know, the newspaper article. So it was pretty interesting. And it was the, the entire, the Native American Voters League was actually put together by um, Aboriginal Tejanos, Tejanos who have been here in, in Texas, South Texas, for generations and generations. Um, and the, it was twofold. One was to participate in the 1939 election of Mari Mar uh, Maverick as mayor of San Antonio. They wanted to make sure that he was mayor of San Antonio that year and, and that they were going to, and that they were fighting for include, to be included in the Fiesta Patrias. That year, uh, LULAC and the Mexican consulate kind of teamed up together and were excluding, uh, were only making it about those that came from Mexico. And so the, the Hano families that have been here for generations uh, fought for inclusivity. So they started using grassroots tactics and took on the city, city applied for permits before the consulate could apply for the permits. They, they, the um, Native American Voters League wanted the festivities to be held at San Pedro Park because that was the place where beginnings, according to my grandmother, that that's where everything started and that's where th that, that should have been celebrated. And um, the, the Mexican consulate wanted it at the municipal auditorium. And that the fight started in July of that year and finally ended um, close to, uh, well, on September, right before September uh, 16th, because this was all about the DSC says. So the whole, everything was happening for the DSC says the, the September of that year. And so according to the newspapers, uh, they all settled hunky dory, you know, and um, the consulate got to have their, their festivities at the, uh, at the uh, municipal auditorium and the Native American Voters League went on to have uh, a small conference on the influence of Europe at San Pedro Park. So um, it was, uh, and, and Maverick won the election. So 
uh, it, so I, it lasted for two years. I think uh, it finally came to an end in 1941. Uh, but in terms of what it did, you know, the fact that Mexican Americans back in a time in the 30s when, when there was a lot going on in our barrios, right? In our barrios, there was a lot going on and um, across the country with Mexican Americans, period. And so the, the idea that they would unite together and take on organizations like LULAC, who they had teamed up with years before, you know, that they were members of years before. And, you know, they all were part of the same communities, uh, but, at, but that they felt that they needed to make a stand um, to be included in fie these fiestas and uh, as Aboriginal people um, was very important. I, I thought was, to me, was, was, was just like American Indians and the, the thought of that, they had just become citizens of the United States. Women had just gotten the rights to vote. And here she was, you know, with, you know, a, a young uh, expecting mother, you know, fighting for her rights as an Aboriginal person of this tierra. Anyway, so you asked me, how do I think it impacted things later on? Well, 30 years later, almost to, you know, 30 years later, uh, my father is now, an active member of the newest of, of the newest effort of Mexican Americans called the uh, Ras, uh, the Mexican Americans of Texas, primarily San Antonio, but of Texas, called the Raza Unida Party. He's an active member, and later becomes the uh, vice chairman from for for from seventy six through seventy eight. You know the Raza Unida Party. Uh, he was very active in the civil rights. And right next to his side was his mother. And before that, she was very active in the Judge Albert Pena campaigns and, uh, and the um, uh, Gonzalez, Henry B. Gonzalez campaigns, very active. And so during the civil rights, she was right there with my dad, supporting his moves, what he was doing, along with others like Mario, Ma Maria Berzabal, Rosie Castro, and other leaders of that time, Maria Confian. Jose Angel Gutierrez and others, Irma Mireles. I mean, the, the list is long of the influence of people of, of San Antonians in, in that effort. So, um, but then, then you fast forward 30 years from, from 1969, it was in 1999 that our families now were able to move our indigenous families from a status of extinction in South Texas to a status of existence because of the work of the activism work that, that took place in the early 90s and in 1999 with the return of our ancestral remains back to the missions of San Juan Capistrano. And that now, we're almost, you know, 30 years from now will be 19, uh, 2029. I don't know what's going to happen then, but I mean, it's pretty obvious that the work that we're involved in today you know, in terms of fighting for Aboriginal rights, fighting to make sure that the indigenous history and the contributions that our people have made to this country, to the state and to the city are recognized and acknowledged moving forward. I think my grandmother had everything to do with that. Great, thank you so much, Ramon. Um, so the next question is uh, for Carmen. Um, and so, Carmen, we are the the incredible breadth of your work, so many volumes uh, and writings as a poet and performance artist and scholar has been widely recognized. But in this um, profile, we also learn a lot about what you already talked about, um, the, um, the folklore work, basically, uh, being a folklorist and actually like an archivist um, in the 1970s for the Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, among other projects. Um, and you had also mentioned to me that you recorded your grandmother's story 
and uh, that it was, uh, and you won't just tell the stories of other members of your family. You had said your grandmother's story was particularly important and pivotal to you. And so um, if you could talk about that, the hows and why is it so pivotal for you and how has it affected your evolution as uh, activist and writer? Um, you know, I come from a family that really had this urgency always to tell the story. It was like they knew that if we knew our story, it was some kind of psychological protection to help us survive. We hear a lot right now about Black families who give their children the talk, you know, about how to protect themselves, how to deal with white society in order to not be killed. But I think of what they were doing with this urgency as being their own version of the talk. I had to know the cuentos. I had to know what the dichos were. My grandmother died when I was one year old, but I knew her not just in some, you know, emotional memory, but my father always said, mi mamá siempre decía. And so I would hear all the stories about her. Now the other grandma, I had contact with and, and, you know, I could record her and all this, but on the paternal side, I never, you know, had a, a real clear memory of having um, conversed with her because I didn't know how to talk in those days. And um, so um, it was funny that when I was about 12 years old, I started asking my elderly tias because my dad was toward the younger end of a family of 12. And so the elderly tias were, you know, like 20 years older than him. And um, I started asking them about my grandma. I was trying to make like a little family tree and so I could understand what they would say, your primo is coming, uh, your primo Gabriel. Oh, Gabriel, el hijo de Gabriel? No, no, no. Gabriel, el hijo de Mariano, el hijo de Gabriel. Not that Gabriel, the other Gabriel was the, you know, and so, they, so I couldn't keep track of who the relatives were. So I said, well, if I plot it on a piece of paper, I'll be able to figure out who all my cousins are. And so it ended up being a family tree. And then I said to one of my tias, the one I found out later was the one who always had the good stories. She was the one who would tell you everything, but not till you were of age. So um, I said to her, grandma's name was Eloisa Sanchez, right? And she says, yes, yes, era Sanchez, pero no era Sanchez. And I said, what? And she said, no era Sanchez, era Hernandez. Okay, so she just told me she's a Sanchez, but she's not a Sanchez. And I'm trying to figure this out. And she starts this story about a young maid in a home of the Hernandez family. The young maid was Natividad Cantu. And Natividad Cantu had been raised by her employers. Criada in the full sense of a child maid, what Today, we would be talking about children that are being trafficked or stolen or enslaved or uh, bartered. Um, um, in those days, they were genisaros. They were children that were stolen by one group and sold off to some other group. So for whatever reason, for her own survival or whatever, she was a maid in this family. And the implications of that are, are very heavy because in today's world, if a child is having problems, or a child, even if an adult is having problems with their employer, you go home and you complain to your family about it and they kind of counsel you on it. Or if you're an older child, you go to your teacher at school and, and maybe the teacher will guide you. But for these criadas, the family was the employer and the family was the teacher and there was no place else to turn and they usually lived out on the rancho. Well, that was her situation. And as she hit 13, 14 years old, Mr. Hernandez and Mr. and Mrs. Hernandez had no children. Um, Mr. Hernandez began to rape her. There was nobody to turn to. There was nobody to complain to. Um, and Mrs. Hernandez would beat her, I guess, because she suspected maybe that there was something going on. So um, it was not a very pleasant situation, but that was where she got her bread and butter. That was her only place isolated out in the rancho. Um, she became pregnant and the beatings kept up for the first couple of months. But then after that, she noticed they started treating her very well. 
oh, this is where the baby's gonna sleep. This is a little ropita for the baby. This is for the baby, this is for the baby. And she put, she was very smart. She was 14 by then. She put two and two together and she figured out what was going to happen. When that baby was born, they were going to steal the baby from her, raise it as their child and kick her out. And nobody would listen to a criada who was in addition to it indígena, you know, uh, the class difference was too, too much. And so none of the authorities would have paid any attention to her claims to have been the mother of the child. So um, what she did, uh, she had thought about it for months. And when the night the baby was born, everybody was exhausted, went to bed late. Um, she got up, she gathered together some tortillitas, she filled a gourd full of water she got a blanket and wrapped the baby and she walked to the next town where, I mean, having just given birth and she walked all night long and part of the next day with no food, no home or anything. It was a very moving story and, um, and I've been starting to write it down, uh, not write it down, but write it from her voice and from her perspective. Now, years after I heard it, um, but the power of this is that, you know, she goes, she goes door to door and finally some kind family says, yeah, we'll take you and your child in and you can recover from the childbirth and, you know, we'll support you and you help us out in return. So she lived there for a while and then a young man named Jose Sanchez came by and kept coming by to visit and fell in love with her and married her and adopted her child that child was my grandmother, Eloisa Sanchez. So that's why she was a Sanchez, but she was really in Hernandez, this is what the Theos would tell me. Those stories give us a deeper understanding of the intersectionality of oppression, how sex and race and class and identity all um, come together in the same, in the same patterns of oppression. Um, and, and it also helps give us, mark us with a deeper respeto for, for those who live at the bottom, who live without advantage. Um, so if we listen to those whispers, we find the answers. If we research those whispers, we find the answers and the whispers are there. And, and Antonia Castaneda, the, uh, our wonderful uh, resource, Dr. Antonia Castaneda, amazing historian, told me once, you know, our history isn't in the book. Sometimes it's between the lines of a song. Sometimes it's in a beach or, you know, sometimes it's in a whisper. And, I, and because of that, I wrote the story, the, the poem, The Story Keeper in here based on that, um, that the story keeper was the one who would try and capture the stories and this, our historians are, are our story keepers and our writers are our story keepers. Sometimes our artists and our musicians are our story keepers. When, when I saw um, the maid in Katagarate's drawings, she had all these beautiful um, drawings of women in rebosos and I saw this young, and she said, oh, es una criada, this young woman who is so alone that you don't even see her face. Uh, her face is wiped out. Um, I could feel those echoes and it could help me write. So it influenced my writing and influenced my whole perspective to have connection to these stories. Um, so later, you know, my, my mom was dragging old pictures out of the attic and and there's some of my, my prized possessions now, and you can't see that one there, but anyway, it's, it's, it's in some of the books, some of my books. And um, they're, they're pictures of people that I knew, or maybe the baby in the picture, I got to know when he was a viejito or something like that. Um, but it made a connection for me, and it also became a gift to the people who wanted to read more of these stories that come from the west side and that one it's one of the little casitas built on the half lot on the west side that's about this wide and you can see the front door and you see the family of like eight of them standing outside for the picture but the little casita is is just a shotgun house you know um it documents our importance and i 
I always recorded the stories, even at age 12, and I still am, um, because I think it helps change the way people think. Uh, I, I'm finishing up a, a coffee table book on the outdoor public art of San Antonio called Arte del Pueblo. And um, the photographer has beautiful, Dr. Fred Preston, these beautiful photographs of our outdoor art. And he wanted me to write like a little poetic narrative to tie these things together into a story of the people of San Antonio. And I, I did, but they're, you know, these things that keep being said and you look at them and say, oh yes, our military history here goes all the way back to the Battle of the Alamo. No, 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 no. Okay, and then, you know, re, you pick up something else. It's our military history goes back 300 years when it was a presidio. No, 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 no. You know, we can't do this. We have to tell the story ourselves in our own voices. We have to tell it the way we know that it's fair and just and say, that, you know, our military history goes back to the First Nations and the intertribal conflicts that happened for the last, you know, probably 12,000 years minimum. We have evidence of, of artifacts that go back that far. So this isn't something new. And I think it's an advantage, not just to the Chicanos, not just to the Latinx, not just to uh, people of color, but to everybody to realize that we are connected, that we have a connection, a human bond that's still going on. So as I, I write the, the adult biography of Emma Tenayuca, um, I'm basing some of the characters on some of the people that I met and whose stories that are recorded. Um, I have a, a, a new book coming out from, uh, from Penguin for the first time. Penguin Books uh, purchased a, um, uh, a novel in verse that I wrote in April of the pandemic because everything else was canceled. Um, and in it, I'm putting the stories of my family, of my friends, uh, of my friends' families. You know, it, it comes through. What we hear of other people's stories, if it affects us inside, it becomes part of us. And so I just think we end up with a, a healthier world. And if someone else's voice was silenced, then we need to use our voices to let their voices be heard. Thank you so much, Carmen. That's, um, those are really truly powerful stories. And that it reminds me also that when we do this work in our own families to be kind of ready, we, we may encounter some pretty difficult truths, mm -hmm. you know, and, and um, as you say, to kind of be willing to listen to those whispers um, because that is such important work too. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, so our, our last question is for uh, Mary Jo. And uh, first, Mary Jo, I wanted to just say I'm so glad to hear that you are writing the um, the story of your grandmother. What a wonderful, what wonderful news. <laughs> uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so your grandmother, Maria Rebecca Latigo de Hernandez, um, now she is kind of getting a little bit of more kind of recognition, right? A Google Doodle and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such widely, you know, such pioneering work in so many different areas, in civil rights, um, in education, in healthcare, and that she was this powerful um, orator and, and, you know, her radio show, just all of these different areas that she worked. And also that she was a midwife for much of her life. Um, these wonderful details that we learn from uh, from the profile, and that largely comes from your research. Um, I'm wondering if you could just tell us more about how how you would describe her legacy um, and kind of the significance of of her work for us today. Well, thank you, um, thank you again for for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about her. She she is my favorite subject, and um, and the, the writing of the book has, has really been a learning experience and, and a labor of love, truly. Um, Maria Latigo de Hernandez was an immigrant and she had many occupations throughout her life. 
and she worked very hard at each one of them. And in this respect, she embodies every immigrant to this country. Her lifelong efforts to promote civic engagement and improve the health care and the education for Mexican Americans are a model for today's youth. Uh, she turned 18 on the day her family crossed the border at Laredo. Before the Mexican Revolution came to Monterrey in 1914, she had been an elementary school teacher and a telephone operator. These were the first of many occupations, but at her core, Maria L. de Hernandez was a social organizer. She had the ability to awaken in people a desire to work together for, for a better future. People were inspired by her words and, and the force of her conviction. Now in Southern Texas, when they first got her, her family picked cotton. And it wasn't until her husband was drafted for World War I that they moved to San Antonio in 1918. She began working as a midwife in the 1920s on the city's west side, advertising in the pages of La, of La Prensa in 1924. This was one of the few careers in, in medicine that were available to Latinas. In 1926, in the infant mortality rate in San Antonio blamed on midwives, resulting in a requirement that they all had to attend obstetric courses offered by the municipal health department. These classes were held at Robert B. Green Hospital and 32 midwives with Spanish surnames graduated from the first course, including Maria L. de Hernandez. Mm -hmm. She founded La Sociedad Obstetrica Fenereta in 1938. Fenereta was a midwife who just happened to be the, the mother of Socrates. So I thought it was pretty amazing that they drew from, from history to name this organization, but it was an organization for practicing midwives and it provided professional development lectures by the area's doctors. The year prior, the year prior to that, 1937, she had created La Asociación Protectora de Madres. Uh, this, would, this helped mothers who were without assistance or medical care during pregnancy and birth. Now you have to understand the infant mortality rate during the first year of life for Mexican Americans in San Antonio at that point was uh, 120 per thousand life births. Put that in context, nearly twice as many white babies lived to see through their first year. Between 1937 and 1939, the La Asociación Protectora de Madre raised more than $1,700. I know that sounds like chump change, but they did it one penny at a time. And if you equate what $1,700 was in 1939, what it was, is today, it's like 30,000 bucks. So it made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Pedro and Maria Hernandez, my grandparents, began collaborating with Alonso Parales and participating in the Orden Caballeros de America as early as 1924, but they took a leadership role in 1929. The Mutual Aid Society emphasized teaching its members respect for and compliance with the state and federal laws. And they also assisted their members when they were in need, when they were sick and uh, attended the funerals. And this is according to their charter that was filed in 1931 with the state. In their first experience with coalition building, the Orden Caballeros de America participated in a meeting in Corpus Christi, Texas, along with El Concilio de Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, de la Orden Hijos de America, and La Liga de Ciudadanos Latinoamericanos. Latino -Americanos. Uh, and that was February 9th, 1929. From that meeting formed the League of United Latin American Citizens or LULAC. Now, unlike LULAC, membership in La Orden Caballeros de America was open to men, women, and their families. And it didn't matter if you were a United States citizen. They raised funds by collecting donations from their members and by sponsoring celebrations of uh, Mexican holidays, the Fiestas Patrias that Ramon was talking about, like Dia de la, la, Dia de la Raza, Cinco de Mayo and Dieciséis de Septiembre. Now, the effort to document the deficiencies in public uh, school system in San Antonio and to improve the conditions for Mexican-American children began as a committee of LULAC Council number 16 that was chaired by Eleuterio Escobar. But it soon spun off from LULAC as La Liga Pro Defensa Escolar. 
in on October 21st, 1934, Maria L. de Hernandez spoke at a community meeting on the patio of Sydney Lanier Junior Senior High School. And as mentioned, this is on the city's west side. The meeting was organized to present the state superintendent of schools with the results of their research and investigations, comparing the conditions of schools on the predominantly Spanish speaking west side of San Antonio with the rest of the city. She was the only a woman in a, in a list of at least a dozen speakers that day, and she spoke last. The other speakers were Eleterio Escobar, Alonzo Parales, Dr. Carlos Castaneda, Dr. George Science, and the members of the Texas legislature. The meeting attracted an audience of 8,000 people. When she spoke, she asked everybody who was here to demonstrate their disgust with the deplorable condition of the schools and with the treatment of their children to please stand up. And everybody stood up, all 8,000 people. She turned and she addressed the state superintendent saying, as my translation, please take this public demonstration as an energetic protest of our disgust with the treatment of our children in the schools. This is, it is not the children's fault that they were born with brown eyes. Under the stars and stripes of the United States flag, they have the same rights as blue-eyed children. They deserve clean drinking water and toilet paper in their school restrooms. Her words rallied the crowd. Everyone was left standing, pressing forward, demanding a translation of her words. Santiago Tafoya Sr. stood up, provided that translation. And the state superintendent of schools visibly fl flushed. He came forward and he said, if things are like you say they are, I'm gonna go back to Austin and fight for you. But he had to be given an escort that day to make sure he safely got away. And that's just one example of how she rallied people, how she inspired people. And, you know, I didn't even mention her radio show, but um, thank you for mentioning that. But uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, what I know about her. And like I said, mo most of it comes from the pages of La Prensa. Okay, so thank you so much, Mary Jo. And, um... I, I, I love hearing that story of the, of the protest at, at Lanier. Um, so I, we just have a, a few minutes. I did want to get to, um, there are a couple of questions that have come up, I think from the Facebook feed. Um, the, the first one that came up a while ago. Um, so what advice would some of the veteran activists here today give to younger activists on the West Side today? Um, and whoever wants to kind of take this question, you can unmute yourself and, and um, just address it. I'd say. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Who's going to do it? Okay, I'll do it. We're losing time. Uh, I think that the first thing uh, that I would say to young people is uh, before they decide to go out and help other people and the word activist was used, that they need to know who they are first. Like, who are you? Why do you wanna help somebody else? Uh, uh, what are your values? You know, and, and to have a deep, uh, uh, reflection about that and then listen to the people that you want to help whoever they are just listen to what their problems are uh, view how th their uh, life is the challenges that they have uh, and then start uh, you know talking to them I think one by one uh, but I think the uh, the the um, advice of knowing yourself is very important because, uh, you know, being an activist, I gather, is somebody who goes out there and works for social justice. That's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to win all the battles. Uh, you won't. And some of them as we have, you know, thank you for that wonderful story about um, Maria Hernandez, uh, Mary, uh, because uh, 
if you were to talk to some parents today, they would have complaints too. So it's like some issues we'll never, um, we'll never solve. Uh, it's about changing systems and understanding that as somebody in the community that's advocating for somebody, for a group of people, we need to be with them, among them, of them eventually, uh, if we earn that right, uh, and then work together to raise their voices so that they can speak for themselves. And I think that's the best uh, advice I can give and that it's for the long haul. It's not something that even in a lifetime you're going to accomplish. I would say um, that we need to unify to win. I think this last election was a good example of how we just all went everywhere. Um, the in order to do that, you have to have something you're working for, not just something you're working against. Um, so uh, don't get overwhelmed with hate. Um, Emma used to say, if there had been any, Emma Tenayuka, when, when I had the fortune to, to speak with her and, and to develop a friendship with her, and she said, if I had had any hate in me, I would have been destroyed. I never would have made it. You have to have love for a cause. And that's what we're here for. We're filled with love for our comunidad, for our gente, for our pueblo, for justice. But it's love that's drawing us because love is a lot stronger than hate or envy or revenge or uh, frustration or um, any of the things that get in the way of our unifying. We are, um, I think people seeking justice are a majority of the population, but we're all splintered. So we really have to learn ways to be a little less snobby and, and take our nice values that come from traditional Mexican American values, which are actually traditional indigenous values, which are, you know, es su modo. It's okay, you make space for people to be different. You don't insist that they all think like we think or act like we act. You just have to find what you do have in common with others and, and bring that group together based on that, not on little picky differences that we don't like about other people. Yeah, I would also say that piggybacking um, on what has already been said is, you know, is to understand your motivation you know, whether it's fear-based or love-based and, uh, and then embrace it. Get to know your motivation and embrace it and then dale ganas, right? Um, but, you know, with that, with everything else is, is said, you know, you have to understand your values. So we either do what we do out of love or we do it out of fear. That if we, we, that if we don't do something, something bad's gonna happen. And understanding that motivation is what's gonna drive us. And it's all, you know, and, it's going to help, you know, us provide that leadership and also that understanding of, you know, when, you know, when you're the follower and when you're the leader, you know, so um, that's where I would start too, is understanding your, your values, getting in touch, embracing your motivation and, um, and surrounding yourself with, with like minds. And I would just add a plug for oral histories. You know, they're often discounted, but when we're looking for the stories that aren't being told, um, oral history is, is, is very valid. So there was another question. Um, so that was, uh, we were just bouncing off of the advice that for veteran activists. And I think Mary Jo, you kind of answered, were addressing the next question in a way. Um, what advice would you give to the younger generation to help continue preserving their history? Um, where do we begin to think of writing a book um, can feel so overwhelming. Any tools to recommend to help organize or writers groups, et cetera. So, 
I guess the tool of oral history is what you suggested. Maybe others have other suggested tools, but are there writers groups that might, that are, you know, oriented toward preserving history for any of you? Are you speaking, Carmen? Oh, there you go. I am. Okay. Uh, um, you know, if you are drawn to write, that's good. If you're scared off at the thought of writing an entire novel or something, or a history book or a scholarly paper, and it just sounds overwhelming, don't get paralyzed and just get stuck in that moment forever and say, well, I can't write a novel. Do what you can do. Um, if writing a book sounds overwhelming, then just think of collecting what you can, writing it down in little pieces, um, giving a copy someplace where you know it's going to be preserved, like, like the Museo del West Side. Having a little piece of information, there doesn't have to be elegantly written even, but information will help others, researchers and historians who want to, who are looking at the big picture and say, hey, I can see five different stories here from people who said that their grandfather worked at such and such place and was fired with blah, blah, blah. This is, this seems to be a pattern. So you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something and you have to do what you can do. Um, and if you are drawn to be a writer, start with little snippets. Maybe you get in the habit of every, I know family doesn't get together for this year, but when family does get together of having little moments when you share a story, did y'all ever hear the story that mama used to tell about and share those things, even if it's orally, it, it makes a difference. Not everything that's preserving history is in the form of a history book. You may be drawn to use other arts like music, uh, painting. Uh, Ramon's father did beautiful paintings. I think he still does, right, Ramon? Of, of capturing our history. And, and they, it, it meant so much to me and to so many people to be able to see pictures of our ancestors the way he had painted them with dignity and with presence and belonging here. Um, I'm not sure if uh, folks have other questions, but I know uh, we've gone beyond our 8.30 closing moment. So I think uh, I, even though we wanna go on another two, three, hours or days or <laughs> years, I, I, would, I, will, I would like to thank Mary, Joe Galindo, Maria Berio Seval, Ramon Vasquez, uh, our querida Carmen Tafoya, and to our dear uh, facilitators, Donna Guerra and Laura Hernandez Erisman, uh, for bringing us so much genius, so much power in your stories and the stories of your antepasadas and uh, we want to invite all, you know, everyone uh, to join the Esperanza in developing and creating uh, the first community-based uh, uh, museo of San Antonio's West Side. And, and again, we know that the history of San Antonio's Mexican, Mexican-American indigenous uh, community, especially working class community, has roots in San Antonio's West Side. And so even if you live on the South Side and the North Side, if you live in New York or California or wherever, if you know, <laughs> there are roots right here in San Antonio's West Side. So please join us in, in helping to develop and create and build the, the, the Museo. Um, and please come back uh, this Saturday, December 12th for a plática en los Matachines de la Santa Cruz at 6 p.m via Esperanza's Facebook page. And in case you don't know who Los Matachines are, Los Matachines are a ritual folk tradition imported from 17th century Spain into Latin America, where it merged with indi the indigenous traditions. Troops throughout Mexico, Texas, and across the United States danced for nine days prior to December 11th, culminating in a vigil on the 11th for the Virgen de Guadalupe in 2020, the Los Matachines de la Santa Cruz received the National Heritage Award from the National Endowment for the Arts. 
So, and as mentioned before, please consider making a donation or better yet, becoming a monthly donor. Muchas gracias. And we'll see you soon at another cultural program or check out our YouTube for past presentations. Buenas noches. Charming Eva Garza is a star on the CBS Network of the Americas. She has just returned from another tour through Latin America. And when you hear her sing the tango, Quiero verte una vez más, you'll understand why our listeners in Latin America think she's tops. Señorita Garza and Quiero verte una vez más, just to see you once more. Tarde que me invita a conversar con los recuerdos, pena de esperar si me llorar en este encierro. Tanto en mi amargura te busqué.